So as you know, with Chapter 7, we saw kinematics already. I'll review that in just a sec from, uh, I don't know, last week or earlier in the week. So we'll see kinematics all over again. That was in Chapter 2. And then in we'll also see Newton's second law, which I don't like in Chapter uh, 4. So we'll see Chapter 2 again, Chapter 4 again. Uh, but now I as it relates to rotation instead of things moving in a straight line. We'll also see energy. We'll see momentum. We'll see some more calculus tools that we'll, we'll consider. Uh, we'll see the cross product, which you've probably never seen before, but some of you will see it in Calc 3. Hey, Emma. Uh, and then we'll also do some more Calculus 3. We'll do some volume intervals as we integrate over three-dimensional objects. So we'll see some old physics stuff that just related in a new realm, and then we'll see some new calculus stuff in this Chapter 7 and mostly Chapter 8. Chapter 9 is going to be sort of a recap of Chapter 4, but we're going to throw torques in. That'll be a take-home portion of your test for Exam 4. So that'll be a pretty big part of your Exam 4 take-home. I say a big part, maybe 20 points or so. And um, then I, I think we're about done. Well, we have a chapter on optics that we'll do that Dr. Balaji wants us to do, read geometrics, so it's just geometric optics. I think that you'll find that... Uh, just once you get some simple rules down, you'll be able to do it pretty easily. Okay? So we're sort of on the downslope as far as this class is going, and just one more exam left. Uh, I did post all of your grades. Uh, exam 3 is there. Uh, it, there is an, a grade calculator on the website. So you can go and put in your grades that you have up till now, and then you can put in what you think you'll make on exam 4 in the final, and you can figure out what your average is. It'll just calculate your average. Um, if you have, I think I said, about 37-ish points on your class participation, that means you're on track to get the full 50. I'll probably post some sort of mid-period between exam 3 and exam 4 to let y'all know when you've maxed out that. Once you get to 50, you can't get any more. And I think a couple of you have already maxed it out or gotten very, very close. So once you get to 50, just like I said, that, that's all. I just stop it right there. Any questions about those grades and sort of how to read them? I think it was straightforward. All right. Um, chapter 7, so far, we've just defined our angular quantities. Remember, we had three quantities. We had theta, we had omega, and we had alpha. You know, a lot of this chapter is just knowing what these variables are and being able to apply them. You have the equations. The problems that you encounter are not going to be terribly difficult. You might have two or maybe three-step problems, but not like we saw in Chapter 3 at all, like with projectile motion. This is not nearly as complex as Chapter 3 is. Uh, so we saw these. We saw our kinematics equations again. Theta equals omega naught t plus 1 half alpha t squared. Notice this is the same form as we saw in Chapter 2. And then we also have our omega equals omega naught plus alpha t. Exact same equations, except where we had x before, I put theta. Where we had z before, I put omega. And where we had a before, we now put alpha. So we just have different variables that we're dealing with. They're not the same as x, v, and a, but they're very, very similar. Remember the units for these, theta, omega, and alpha, the SI units are radians radians per second, and radians per second squared. Uh, we also saw that these were related to our linear quantities, that S is equal to theta times R. you got to be very careful with your units here, that this must be in radians. I always remember this because if I think about the circumference of a circle, it's 2 pi R. That's where this comes from. It comes from the expression for S, right? When theta goes to 2 pi, that's a full circle then the circumference, which is the distance around a full circle, is equal to 2 pi for theta times r. But remember, theta has to be in radians. you got to be very careful with your units in this chapter and the next chapter, in fact. Whenever you doubt, you go to what for angles? You always go to radians, whenever in doubt. Now, you don't always have to go to radians, and you'll see that, like when we're doing these kinematics problems, not necessarily has to go to radians. But if you're ever in doubt, just convert them to radians. Uh, Z was equal to omega R, and then A was equal to alpha R. And you'll notice, too, that the units work out here. 
for omega times r, radians per second times r, which is in meters, that gives us meters per second. Radians isn't really a unit, so it just sort of mysteriously floats away. So it's not really a, a real unit of, of, a, of a distance. It's something different. All right. Well, let's see. So that's it as far as what we've seen before. Now, there are some homework problems for kinematic in your homework. I would certainly look over those and look back at some of the old tests. But I'll probably, you know, have very similar questions to the homework and look back at the old tests for extra practice on those, too. Y'all good with me on this stuff? Yeah. All right, we'll have some more time. We're going to do some quicker questions. But let's go forward to centripetal acceleration right now. Uh, so if I have an object that is rotating, say like this, I have it going around a circle at a certain radius at a certain constant speed. So this thing is going around my head. And you're getting very, very sleepy. Very sleepy. Uh, you are sleepy, aren't you? Yeah, because I can hypnotize you. All right. Uh, as it goes around at a constant speed, how do I describe its velocity? Is its velocity, if this thing is traveling around at a constant speed, how would I describe what's happening to the velocity? Is the velocity constant or is it changing? The speed is constant, because I said it's going around at a constant speed. Goodness, bless you. But remember, velocity is what type of quantity? Is it a scalar quantity or a vector quantity? It's a vector quantity. So as this thing is moving around at a constant speed, the magnitude of the velocity is not changing, right? But what is happening to the direction of the velocity? It's constantly changing. The direction of the velocity, as this thing moves around, is in this direction here. But when the object's over here, the velocity is in that direction. And when the object is over here, the velocity is in that direction, and on and on. So while the speed is constant, the, the uh, direction of v is always changing. And what do we use to describe a changing velocity? What describes to us the rate of change of velocity? Sorry, the what? No? Okay, the derivative of the velocity describes the change. But what is the derivative of the, the acceleration? So if I have something moving with constant speed but changing velocity or changing direction, then I have to have an acceleration. But it's not in the same kind of acceleration that we've talked about. It's something that we call centripetal acceleration. So uh, changing velocity is caused by an acceleration, or is described, or however you want to say, is caused by an acceleration. And we call this um, centripetal acceleration. Centripetal means center-seeking. So this word means center-seeking. That's just what the word means. And that means then that the acceleration will always be towards the center of the circle. So the acceleration here is towards the center of the circle. The acceleration here towards the center of the circle. The centripetal acceleration is always towards the center of the circle. We all heard that song by uh, that country music star, her name. She's like talking about something up here, but she says centripetal. It's centripetal motion. You all know what I'm talking about? Who is that? Still saying it. It's Faith Hill, right? Yeah, Faith Hill. Uh, what's the song? Can anybody sing it? Y'all know the song? Oh yeah. Oh, it's this kiss, right? Yeah, this, 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 this. Centripetal is a, a, uh, another word that's similar to centripetal, and it means uh, away from the center. 
often we'll think, and we'll talk about this later why this is, but often it appears that the acceleration that we have is actually not center seeking, but away from the center of the circle. And that's why she talks about centrifugal motion because it's like a mystery, right? I mean, that's her whole point that it's right that you don't understand this kiss, this kiss, that it's like centrifugal motion, uh, because centrifugal motion is or centrifugal is not really real; that it's imaginary. It's not something that exists. But centripetal acceleration very much is something that exists, and it's towards the center of the circle. All right, this centripetal acceleration we can calculate. Uh, I'm going to call it AC. Sometimes this is also called AR for radial, R for radial, but I'll call it AC. And it's equal to V squared over R. This little R is for radial. C, of course, is for centripetal. But it's equal to the speed squared divided by the radius of the motion. All right. It is in meters per second squared, just like our regular acceleration. Can I go down from here? Yeah. Now, if I have an acceleration, oh, so I can also find an alternative form, form for the centripetal acceleration. If AC is equal to V squared over R, and I know that V is equal to omega R, I can plug this in, and I get AC equals omega R squared divided by r, and so this is equal to omega squared r. So I have two expressions for centripetal acceleration here and here. You can use either one, and they're both on your equation sheet. In fact, you know, you'll have that equation sheet from here on out, and all the equations that we have so far are on that equation sheet. But uh, these are similar. It's just a matter of what do you have in the problem. If you have v and r, then you can use this. If you don't have V, if instead you have omega, then you can use this expression. Or if you have omega and you have R, you can also calculate what V is, right? But it's just to sort of make your life a little easier. Now, if we have, a if we have an acceleration, then I know that I must have a force because forces cause acceleration. Right? That's what Newton found in his second law. That's what he described is that forces cause acceleration. So if I have a centripetal acceleration, I must have a force of some sort. We call that force a centripetal force. Now, hopefully, it took me years to understand this. Like, I remember sitting in this class, not this class, but my introductory physics class, and I never really understood centripetal forces. And even my wife told me. She told me that it was just, like, maybe 10 years ago that she came to understand what a centripetal force is. When we talk about a centripetal force, it's not like some other force that exists out there. We use that word to describe some force that already exists in a system. It's a force that causes circular motion. So for example, in this case, what is the centripetal force? What is the force that's causing circular motion? The tension in the string, right. So the tension in the string then, that is the centripetal force. Now it's not the same for every system. So, for example, if I'm traveling in a car and I'm going around a curve, what is the centripetal force? Let's say it's a flat curve and I'm traveling around. What is the centripetal force in that case? The friction between the tires and the road. By the way, is that static friction or kinetic friction between the tires and the road? What do you think? Yeah, you all say kinetic, right? A few people said, do you all think kinetic? All right, well, think about the tires on the road. Your tires rotate, right? And they, they go along the road, on the road, rotating along the road. Think about the surface of the tire and the surface of the road. Are those static with respect to one another? Or do they slide across one another? What do the tires do? They're static with respect to one another. In fact, if your tires stop moving, then they start sliding. And what type of friction is that? Sliding friction. That's kinetic. And that's why we have systems like the anti-lock braking system. You ever wondered why, why the heck do I have an anti-lock braking system? You ever wondered that? Have you? No, did you ever have an old car? Like a really old car, 60s, 50s, 70s? What, is, no, yeah, what do you have to do if you want to stop quickly in an old car? You have to pump the brakes, right. The reason you pump the brakes is so what? 
so your back end, so your tires don't lock up. Because if you slam on the brakes, that's what will happen. And when that happens, your tires are sliding, and your kinetic friction, as you know, is not as good. So the anti-lock braking system in a car, which we all have, no car comes without it, is pumping the brakes. It does it very quickly. Turn your brakes on, off, on, off, on, off. So that it never allows your wheels to actually lock up. It brings them more slowly to a stop. But you didn't know that, did you? So you go tell somebody about the ABS system in your or the ABS in your car, the anti-lock braking system. And they'll say, gosh, you're pretty cool. Right? And that's really the purpose of why we're here, so we look cool. All right. Um, so the centripetal force is a term used to describe an already existing force. Something causes a centripetal force. So with the hand in the ball, I have something going around like this. It's uh, the tension in the string. So the tension then, the force tension, is the centripetal force. Uh, we can calculate the centripetal force. I know that F is equal to M times A. That's our centripetal acceleration, so that's equal to mv squared over r. That is our centripetal force. Also, let's just go back to those other scenarios. If I have a car going around a curve, the centripetal force is the static friction. Uh, if I have the ball on the string, have you ever been on that ride called the Gravitron? They might have, I think they have it at Volunteer Fireman's Fair. The gravitron, you go into it and you spin around at a, at a, you know, a modest rate. What's the centripetal force in that case, in that ride? Right, the wall pushes up against your back. And we call that force a what? What type of force is that? If a surface pushes on an object, what is it? It is a contact force, but it's a particular type of contact force the normal force, right? It's perpendicular to the surface. So like in the Gravitron or in like a salad spinner or whatever, you have people that are standing here. The centripetal force in this case is the normal force. What if you have a car that is traveling along an incline or a bank curve? That's a car coming at you. Uh, what is the centripetal force in that case? Not exactly, no. I mean, uh, yeah, sort of, kind of. What is it? Centripetal force in this case is actually several things. Do you know what they are? One of them is the weight, right? The weight is part of it because part of our weight is down in this direction, which has a component that pushes back this way. Or it's really not really the weight, but it's the what of the inclined plane. Same as here. The normal force, all right, which is due to the weight. And then what else it provides a centripetal force here? The frictional force. So here we have the normal force and the frictional force. Or at least some component of those provide the centripetal force. We'll explore those in some of our homework problems, and we'll see some other examples as well. All right. Um, let's try this clicker question. An object is traveling in a counterclockwise circular path. As shown, at this point, right here, you cut the string. That means that you take away the centripetal force, because remember the tension is the centripetal force. What happens then to the path that the, the ball follows? Does it follow A, B, C, or D? Well, let's do about 10 more seconds. Let's stop at 55. 55. 
Okay, B is right. Awesome. Look, if I have this object and it's traveling in a circular path, if I let it go and if I take away the, the centripetal force, it's no longer going to be traveling in a circular path. And so whatever velocity vector it has at that particular point, that's the velocity vector that it's going to maintain because it will no longer be accelerating. So right here, I'm going to let it go. All right. It travels in a straight line. Did you think it was going to hit you? It might have. It's not very hard, though. <laughs> it's it. All right. So uh, B is the right answer. Hey, what do you call a cow with two legs? Lean beef. Did I count that right? Yeah. Okay, let's try this one. I have this truck that's going around a flat curve, radius of 120 meters with a maximum speed of 25 meters per second. What maximum speed can it go around a curve having a radius of 75 meters? Now remember, what is, I have this truck going around a flat curve. What is the centripetal force in this case? What It's the frictional force. Right. So the frictional force provides the centripetal force. So the, the frictional force, which we know is mu times the force normal, is equal to the centripetal force, which is mv squared over r. So the, the uh, frictional force, mu times m times g, is equal to the centripetal force, which is mv squared over r. Yes, sir. Couple steps to follow here. I'm going to write what I said up here. Give you a little guidance here. You don't know what mu is. You can figure out what mu is, and that will describe to you the condition of the road. A road that has a lot of friction has a high coefficient of static friction. A road that doesn't have much friction, like a wet road, has a low coefficient of kinetic fr uh, static friction. In this case, a 120-meter curve, my maximum speed that I can travel is 25 meters per second. I want to know what if I make that curve tighter, I'll make the radius less at 75 meters, then what will be my speed? Remember, um, when you're doing multiple choice questions, not in this class, but in others too, a good way to approach it is to look at qu options that are not reasonable and get rid of them. I have two options here that are not reasonable. Which ones are they? B and D are not reasonable. That's right, Asia. Why are they not reasonable? Right, because, yeah, if I make my curve tighter, if I go around a tighter curve, the speed is going to decrease, and those two values are more than 25 meters per second. All right, let's wrap this up. I'll stop at four minutes. Five more seconds.
Okay, good. So y'all are pretty split between A and C. A um, couple different ways you can do this. I'm going to sort of do it the wrong way. But I can say that MV squared over R, my centripetal force, that it is the frictional force, mu mg. Now, I don't know the mass of the truck, but it's a good thing here that my masses cancel. That's also a good thing because on roads, when they have those signs that are posted, they calculate the speed or they measure the speed in this way. They figure out what is the coefficient of static friction, and then they say, okay, how fast can you go? So those signs apply for a wide range of masses. So, and that's re represented here that our masses cancel. That it doesn't matter your mass when you're going around those roads, that they'll cancel out. Unless you're like a big truck, and then the center of mass changes in those. Uh, I can calculate mu here. I so said that describes the condition of the road. V squared divided by GR. So taking G's values, 25 squared over 10 times 120. I get 0.53, and then I can consider now my new radius, which is 75 meters. Uh, I can take this same equation and solve for V, which is the square root of mu gr. I took this equation, I cross multiplied, or I multiplied both sides by r, and then took the square root. So I get mu times g times r, multiplying both sides by r and then I take the square root to get an expression for V. And if I do that, with now my coefficient, 0.53 times 10 times R, which is 75 meters, I get 20 meters per second. All right. There's a homework problem that's similar to this. And there are some other ways that you can set up ratios here, which makes it a little bit easier. But I, I find it that students often do better this way, where you're finding out what is the coefficient of static friction and then figuring out what is the velocity. All right, the point here is, though, that the centripetal force is just another force. It's a, like a class of forces. In every system where you have circular motion, you have some force, some component of a force, are some combination of forces that are causing that circular motion. Make sure I use the right answer. All right, let's do some clicker questions. Uh, have we done any of these? No. Yeah, the rabbits. Have y'all done these, some of these? Can somebody tell me where we left off? Asia, do you have it written down? Okay. So we just the fan. Okay. So this fan blade is slowing down. What are the signs of omega and alpha? Remember, our clockwise is negative, counterclockwise is positive. And then also remember that the same rules apply here as they did in Chapter 2, that when something is slowing down, the velocity and acceleration are an opposite, have opposite signs. When they're speeding up, they have the same sign. I'll stop at uh, 50. Okay, awesome. B is right. Omega is negative. Omega is negative because it's clockwise. It's clockwise motion, so I have negative omega. And then it says it's slowing down, so that means that alpha is positive. 
positive because it's slowing down, so it will be opposite what it was for omega. So omega is negative, and alpha is positive. Did y'all hear about the uh, Energizer Bunny? He was arrested. It was in the Triparis Times. Did y'all hear about that? He was arrested for battery. <laughs> All right. Kinematics problem, or this is just a conversion actually. We've got five revolutions per second. Is it rotating? What is its angular velocity in radians per second? One revolution is equal to how many radians? One full circle is equal to how many radians? The unit circle goes from zero to pi over two to pi to nine and nine to the full circle. Let's stop in uh, seven seconds at 120. 120. Okay, D is right. Remember, one revolution is two pi radians. So if I have five revolutions per second, uh, one revolution is 2 pi. 2 pi is approximately equal to 6. 5 times 6 is about 30. So D is the right answer. You're going to have some conversions. Uh, you might just have some straight up just, I asked you, what is this in radians or revolutions or degrees per second or whatever per second squared or just convert angle to the radians or whatever. And then also in certain problems you'll need to convert to maybe SI units on the next test. Just make sure that you know how to do these conversions. If you know the conversion factors, which I think most of you have them in there somewhere, you just got to sort of pull them up. And I think actually they're on the equation sheet too. Okay. Let's try this one. This one's a little tricky. I, I'll explain it to you in just a moment. I'm going to stop at uh, 105. And then after this, we'll work through a homework problem. Uh, the answer here is, is D, none of these. Let me show you why. So if I have this girl or child that's in a swing, Right. She goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then at the lowest point, at the lowest point right here, I have some forces acting on her. I have the normal force. That's the same as the, ten or that's, you know, the surface of the swing pushes down in on her. And then I also have the weight, Fw. So just like we did in Chapter 4, I can say that the sum of the forces is equal to the mass times the acceleration. But her acceleration is her centripetal acceleration. N she's not accelerating otherwise. It's just her centripetal acceleration. Um, and so 
the sum of the forces is Fn minus Fw. Or if we want to replace this Fn with a tension, that's okay too. They're the same forces. Is equal to the mass times the centripetal acceleration. Now let's look at this. The tension in the rope is equal to a weight. That's not true. The tension in the force is actually, the tension in the rope is equal to the weight plus this extra value. Because A is not right. The tension in the rope is equal to her mass times her acceleration. That's not true either because the tension in the rope minus the weight is equal to her mass times acceleration. So her acceleration is downward. That's not true either. That is the acceleration due to gravity, but she's not accelerating downward. And so D is the right answer. We'll work through a problem like this. There's one on the homework, but we'll work it here in class. Try this one. Angular speed is negative. Angular acceleration and speed are anti-parallel. That means they're in opposite directions. The angular speed of the rigid object is which of these? That's your name, what they put. Y'all are sort of all over the board. But remember, this is very similar to the fan blade thing. Ask yourself, what does the angular speed being negative mean? And then what does it mean that the speed and the acceleration are opposite directions or anti-parallel? I'm going to stop at 115. 115. All right, uh, if it's negative, if omega is less than zero, what does that tell us about the speed? Is it clockwise or counterclockwise? Clockwise. Clockwise is negative. So it has to be either A or B. That's good. That's what y'all put. But now I want to ask the question, what does it mean that the angular velocity and acceleration are anti-parallel? Now, the velocity is negative. The acceleration, then, is what? Is positive. What does that mean? It's speeding up or slowing down? Slowing down. Be careful. Positive acceleration does not mean necessarily speeding up. I know why you think that, because it seems like it should be the case. But it's not necessarily the sign of the acceleration that's important. It's its relationship to the velocity. We saw the same in Chapter 2, that you could have negative acceleration and be speeding up, and you could have positive acceleration and be slowing down. The same is true here. Angular velocity is negative because it is slowing down or because they're anti-parallel. Uh, the angular acceleration is positive, and so it's slowing down. So B is the right answer here. All right, I will post these on the website. You can look at them there. Let's look at a homework question. Which one was it? There are some kinematics questions here that you should work through. Uh, number three actually requires substitution, so look at it closely and think about how you'll solve that. Here's one like the friction problem that we had. Where's that? Well, I guess I didn't have one of those. Um, let's work one anyway. I'm going to come up. You should have a blank page at 196. 196. Something akin to the um, to the kid on the swing. Let's look at this. Let's say that I have uh, a car going over some hills. So I have a car 
that is traveling. over some hills. Let's say that the, uh, the mass of the car is 100 kilograms. It's like a go-kart or something. And it's traveling at a speed equal to um, uh, 10 meters per second. And it goes over these hills that have a certain radius. Right here, the radius is 5 meters. And right here, the radius similarly is 5 meters. Right. Now what I want to know is what is the normal force acting on the car at each point? What is the normal force at point A right here? And what is the normal force B right here? Now where is the normal force going to be greater? At point A or at point B? Listen, out we go to Missouri, my wife's from Missouri, and out in Missouri they have these big rolling hills. You ever been over rolling hills? Yeah, West Virginia, right? You ever go really fast? We like to go fast. There's this big, long stretch of road, and we like to go really fast over these hills because it's like riding a roller coaster, sort of. What happens when you go over a big, steep hill and you're going fast? What happens? I know, it's like... It does. You sort of lift up in your seat a little bit, right? The same on a roller coaster. That if you go over a hill like this, it's like you just sort of lift up out of your seat. And the reason is that your normal force here is less. So it feels like you're, li you know, you are actually lifting up out of your seat. But the normal force here is less. Whereas if you go in a deep hill like this, then your normal force is greater. So let's just sort of begin with that idea that the normal force at point A is bigger than the normal force at B. And we just sort of know that from our experience, our wide experience in driving over hilly ground, right? <laughs> okay, so let's think about at each point. At this point, what are the forces that I have acting on this object? Well, I have the normal force acting up. I'll call this FNA. Get rid of this point right here. And then I also have the weight of the object, Fw. And then over here, I have the normal force. I'll call this Fnb. And then here, I have the weight of the object. So I have the same forces acting on both of them. And now I want to write Newton's second law. I can say that the sum of the forces in the y direction that is equal to m times a. And I know that a is the, ex the centripetal acceleration. And then similarly over here, I can say the sum of the forces equals m times a, the centripetal acceleration, which is in the y direction. So over here on the left, I say fna minus fw is equal to the mass times the centripetal acceleration. Now, in this case, what is the sign of my centripetal acceleration? Is it in the positive y or the negative y direction? Centripetal means, uh, what does it mean? Center seeking. And so it's towards the center of the circle. Does that put my centripetal acceleration up or down? It goes up. So it's going to be positive because if I were to draw my centripetal acceleration vector, AC at this point, it would look like that. So I'm going to put a little positive here just to remind me that that value has to be positive. Then I can calculate FNA. It's going to equal to FW plus the mass V squared over R. Now over here, I can do the same thing. I have FNB minus FW equals the mass times the centripetal acceleration. Is that centripetal acceleration going to be positive or negative? It's going to be negative because my centripetal acceleration vector is center seeking. It's always towards the center of the circle. So if I want to calculate FNB, say FNB equals FW minus MV squared over R. 
So in this scenario, this is where you come up out of your seat because you're going over this hill and it feels like your normal force is less than it is over here. Your normal force is less and that's why it feels like you're coming up out of your seat. Now we can go on and calculate these because we have all the values we need. This is going to be 100 kilograms times G, which is 10, plus 100 times 10 squared. Uh, this is G right here, there, and then this is V. Divided by R, which was 5 meters. And so that's 1,000 plus 10,000 divided by 5 is 2,000 is 3,000 newtons. So that's my normal force in this case. Over here, my normal force is going to be 1,000 minus 2,000. So that's going to tell me actually that my normal force is negative 1,000. It's not that the normal force changes direction, but it's actually that you're coming up off the ground in this case. You are front. You're like Dukes of Hazard, right? You ever watch Dukes of Hazard? You're a kid. Yeah, maybe. Anyway, you're like Dukes of Hazard flying up over that hill that you're not actually making contact with the hill. Okay? I think. Any questions about this, folks? It's a lot like the. Uh, the kid in the swing problem. All right. Um, we have a few minutes, but we have a new chapter, too. I don't want to start a new chapter today. So, Remember, I will return your exams on Monday. Uh, and But if you want to drop by later today, after I send out an email, I'll let you know when you can do so. Have a good weekend, okay?